The first few days it was touch and go. We didn't know whether Terry was going to live or not. From her collapse, she suffered a lack of oxygen to her brain and um, suffered profound brain injury. And she remained uh, dependent on others uh, for her care since that night. Initially, after Terry's collapse, uh, we were all working together with Michael uh, and our family, trying to do everything we, we could to, to, to help Terry to improve her condition. She was in hospitals, and then she was in nursing homes, and then she went to California to put the implant in her, you know, in her head, um, see if that would help. And um, when she came back here, she went into a, a rehab center down in Bradenton. Doctors believed that she was a candidate for rehabilitation therapy. So we started aggressively uh, doing that, providing her the therapy and rehabilitation that doctors recommended that she needed. And she was improving. And that's when she was starting to talk down there, you know, stop, mommy, okay, you know, little things. The first couple of years, uh, after 1990, after her collapse, there are notes in her medical files where nurses were writing that Terry was starting to speak. She was forming words from her rehabilitation, and she was getting better. Um, and we were very encouraged by that. Meanwhile, Terry remained in nursing homes. Her early improvements did not continue. Her diagnosis, persistent vegetative state. Terry Schiavo was not brain dead. She was not maintained uh, or, or sustained at all by uh, machines. Terry was fed differently than you and I. Uh, she was fed through a tube, but she was fed at night. So during the day, she was sitting, she could be sitting up in a chair watching TV. And she wasn't on any type of other machines. Nothing else was hooked up. There were no IVs. There was no respirators. Terry was simply a disabled woman. Paul McHugh, a professor at Johns Hopkins, speaks about this. He says, PVS, persistent vegetative state, is not death hidden by machinery. Okay? It is life lived under altered neurological or mental circumstances. Terry normally was still. Uh, she did not make sound. She didn't really move around much. But when she sensed her mother's presence and her smell and her touch, Terry lit up like a Christmas tree every time and began vocalizing. She would immediately recon recognize my mom's voice, and a, and a smile would immediately come to her face. Okay, it's mommy. She said, Terry, what are you doing? She laughed at my dad's jokes. She, she giggled when my dad would kiss her with his mustache. She would, she would pull away and because he would purposely do it, of course. Uh, it you know, scratched her face a little bit. and So she, she just had a huge connection with her family, as she always did. She wasn't terminal. Uh, she was essentially physically healthy. As, as you or I, I mean, all of her organs and her vital signs were very strong. She was a, a woman living with a disability, just like the, uh, I believe there's 40 million, 40 or more million people in our country today that are living with some type of disability. Huh? Can you look this way? You know, we were visiting Terry. Uh, my parents were doing everything they could to at least provide her the, um, uh, the stimulation they could just as parents. What's the matter? To, to show her the love and, and compassion that... that that parents give a child. The next step we took is we wrote Michael Shago a letter. And, and we asked him, you know, please give Terry back to us. Uh, you know, no strings attached. We just want our daughter. And of course that letter was ignored. <laughs> Terry languished without therapy or rehabilitation for five more years while the Schindlers continued to fight for guardianship. Then, things took a turn for the worse. Eight years uh, after her collapse in 1998 was when Michael finally decided that instead of uh, doing what he promised he was gonna do to the jury and to my family, he now petitioned the court to remove her feeding tube, subtly saying that Terry would not want to live as a, as a disabled the adult. The courts and the husband want to starve this disabled woman She's not terminally ill, she's disabled. They want to starve her to death? Of course the family wanted to prevent this. Take Terry home, care for her. But there were opposing arguments. The real question is not whether someone would want to care for them, but what the patient 
would have wanted. Michael, in the first few years of Terry, after Terry's cardiac arrest, believed the same as the parents. He misinterpreted the involuntary actions of, of Terry as as consciousness and he he said she's there and I can I know she's there and I know she understands me and I know she can get better and so it was that took a long time for him we still believed with love care taking her home making her part of the family maybe future advancements that Terry could get better Terry open your eyes they loved her the way she was but they thought there could be gradual improvement over time the husband had pretty much written her off. That's why he warehoused her, isolated her, cut off all the rehab and therapy. And so his argument was she would never get back. No one in this world will tell me that she didn't know who I was. You could tell. I mean, I could stand at the door before I went in and just say, Terry, it's mommy. And she would start laughing. She would turn her head to the door. And when I got in there, she would try so hard to talk to me, but we just couldn't understand her. Oh. How's your cold? Huh? How's your cold, sweetheart? Are you better? Are you better? I know from the many hours I spent with Terry Schiavo, and I'm not a medical doctor, but I was not also interested in prosecuting a case where I didn't feel in my heart of hearts what we were advocating was 100% true. I know she was not in PBS. I know that she was at least minimally conscious and even beyond. I, I hope and pray anybody watching this never has a disability like she had. But here's a girl that's recognizing people, interacting, responding to her family, showing emotion. She's alive. Disabled, but alive. She had very profound brain injuries. I mean, you would not expect her to respond like a normal person. That didn't mean she had to die. In spite of arguments about the sanctity of every life, Pinellas County Judge George Greer ruled in 2000 that Terry's feeding tube should be removed, and it set off a chain of bitter court battles. Go over here on this side now. There was over 40 doctors that had either examined Terry or submitted affidavits that looked at this case and said that either Terry was not in this persistent vegetative state and or could have been helped with the technology that was available today. Many of the doctors that examined Terry felt as though it was remarkable that she was responsive and alive and, and uh, was interacting as much as she was given the fact that the last amount of therapy re rehabilitation she had was at that time it was closing in on 10 years. As the case grew in profile, some of the leading neurologists from around the country were willing to come in and testify. But there's one doctor that I think is probably the most unbiased in the mix. Weeks before Terry Schiavo's death, a doctor uh, from the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, on behalf of the state of Florida, went in to see Terry Schiavo. This is an independent neurologist, highly trained, and he came back with the overwhelming opinion that Terry Shiva was alive, she was not in PBS, and that she should indeed be kept alive. The judge in this case did not want to hear. In March of 2005, the Schindler family took Terry's fight to the United States Congress, asking them to direct the federal courts to hear their case. They wanted that original case reopened. They wanted to introduce new facts and have the existing facts be re-examined. The Senate of the United States, by a procedure unanimously supported Terry Schiavo's right to go into federal court and have her case re-reviewed. A privilege, by the way, that we give to convicted killers and to others convicted of horrible crimes, but because Terry was disabled and she wasn't a criminal, she didn't get this. In Washington, Congress debates what has come to be known as Terry's Law. Meanwhile, the Schindler's appeals run out and Judge Greer's death order is enforced. For the first time in the United States of America, society has been given the ability to put to death a profoundly disabled person even without that person's clear consent. Friend, that is frightening.
I was in Washington, D.C. I was sitting down ready to do an interview with CNN. And uh, as I was waiting, I was watching the TV, and it said Judge Greer had just uh, ordered Terry's feeding tube removed. And uh, I, I remember I got up out of my chair and just left. I remember CNN was doing everything they could to try to get me to sit down and do an interview. And I was just like, not now. Now keep in mind, Terry's feeding tube was removed twice before, and both times it was put back in. I truly never believed that Terry was going to die. Even the day the feeding tube was removed, I thought, okay, well now we just have to get it put back in. Terry's law is signed by the President of the United States at 1.11 a.m. on March 21st, 2005. Terry has been without food and water for three days. And after the, the law was passed, I remember I was on the first plane back down to uh, be with my family. Uh, extreme, I was encouraged. Uh, we were very happy because we thought that um, uh, Terry's life was going to be spared once again. The family's optimism is short-lived. A federal judge quickly ruled against the Schindlers there would be no full rehearing of the facts. After over a decade of fighting this landmark case, Terry was out of options. And something was going to happen. They can't do this. And I guess that's when I decided, you know, that I, I better, uh, you know, brace myself because this looks like the, it's, you know, no one's going to help her this time. When I was in the room with Terry, the last time her mother would see her alive, I was aghast at what I saw. Uh, please understand, the media wasn't allowed in. I believe if television cameras were allowed in, Terry Schiavo would be alive today. The first thing that hit me was the noise. I thought a machine had broken, that air conditioning or something had mechanically broken, and then I realized that was Terry Schiavo's breathing. Mary Schindler was prohibited from wiping her daughter's brow or putting ice chips or a sponge on her daughter's tongue. I was with Terry up until actually moments before her death. It was, the word barbaric uh, comes into a horror movie, stuff that creates nightmares. I mean, Terry physically, her body was going through just horrific changes, and she was in, obviously in a lot of pain. And again, it's another one of these, these big lies that, that is told uh, about someone dying from dehydration and starvation. Michael Chavez's attorney said it was a peaceful and painless way to die. He came out and did a press conference and said that he never saw Terry look so beautiful. It was definitely not a peaceful way to die. That's, they, they sell that bill of goods to people so they can continue to do it. Uh, but it was the most awful thing I've ever seen in my life. Terry is now with God and she's been released from all earthly burdens. After these recent years of neglect at the hands of those who were supposed to protect and care for her, she is finally at peace with God for eternity. For the volunteers that have helped our family, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you to the hundreds of doctors who volunteered to help Terry. Thank you to the lawyers who stood for Terry's life in the courtrooms of our nation. Thank you to all people of faith who demonstrated love for Terry and strength of conviction to defend the sacredness of all human life as a precious gift from God. As a member of our family, unable to speak for yourself, you spoke loudly. As a member of our family, unable to stand under your own power, you stood with a grace and a dignity that made your family proud. Terry, we love you dearly, but we know that God loves you more than we do. We must accept your untimely death as God's will. Our prayer at this time is that our nation will remember the plight of persons with disabilities and commit within our hearts to defend their lives and their dignity for many generations to come. By order of the government, a healthy young woman was denied food and water until she died. It's unthinkable. 